I wore this thing on my arm for four weeks and it's actually one of my favorite pieces of health optimizing tech. In fact, it's already changing the entire world of wearables and here's why. What's going on guys? For those of you who are new here, my name is Kevin Jabal, physician entrepreneur based in Las Vegas. You may know me as the guy that quit plastic surgery to go focus on some entrepreneurial dreams. So this is Levels, and they're bringing continuous glucose monitors, or CGMs, to the masses. This technology approximates your blood sugar level by actually measuring your interstitial blood sugar, which is the fluid surrounding your cells. It has this tiny little filament to do so, and every couple minutes it takes a reading and then syncs with your phone. Now since CGMs first came out in the late 1990s, they've been almost exclusively used by diabetic patients or those who have some metabolic dysfunction. But as we focus on health optimization and prevention of chronic illnesses, we're beginning to realize that there's a lot of utility for these devices for healthy people as well. Now the reason I'm using quotations around healthy is that 88% of Americans have some level of metabolic dysfunction. It's crazy. And no, being young or physically fit does not make you immune. So I was so excited about this tech when I first heard about it last year that I shelled out some cash and did everything I could to get in the front of the line because there are tens of thousands of people that wanna get one of these and use one of these because it's really exciting, especially the implementation they've done. So no, this is not a sponsored video, unfortunately. If you're healthy, if you're young, if you don't have diabetes, you may be thinking, hey, I'm healthy, why should I really care about this? It seems like it's unnecessary. I got two categories for you. Now, first and most obviously is improved short-term performance. And the reason I'm focusing on this is because a lot of us don't like delayed long-term, hey, if I do this a million times over 10 years, then I'll be healthy. We want something immediate. And you do actually get a performance boost. Ever had a food coma or an afternoon slump after lunch? That's often at least in part attributed to a carbohydrate heavy meal. So what happens is you have hyperglycemia from all the carbs and then your body, reacting to the high blood sugar, pumps out insulin, causing reactive hypoglycemia, meaning your blood sugar is too low. As a result, you feel tired and you can't focus. Even though the brain is roughly 2% of your body weight, it burns through roughly 25% of your calories. And if you're studying really hard or doing other very cognitively demanding tasks, then it can burn even more. And while I'm focusing on the mental performance benefits, there's also definitely some physical performance benefits, in particular with regards to exercise endurance. The second, and arguably more importantly, would be the massive implications on metabolic fitness. Metabolic fitness is essentially our ability to use various food substrates as fuel sources as effectively as possible. So let's say, like most of us in the Western world, you don't eat the cleanest diet, and every now and then you'll have some processed food, some carbohydrate heavy meals that spike your blood sugar. When your blood sugar rises, your pancreas secretes insulin, which is a hormone causing that blood sugar to be taken up by the cells of the body. And if you keep repeatedly having these higher levels of glucose and these higher levels of insulin, you can develop insulin resistance, which leads to metabolic syndrome, which leads to diabetes. Now, when insulin resistance happens, less sugar is taken up by the cells of the body, so then your actual blood sugar level is higher on average. You also now have higher levels of insulin in the blood. Now, these factors actually prevent fat from your adipose tissue from being mobilized and used as a fuel source. And if that wasn't bad enough, you got other issues too, like inflammation, oxidative stress, and others. We now know that a lot of chronic illnesses are actually rooted in metabolic dysfunction. Things like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, obesity, and many, many more. Here's what good metabolic fitness looks like. After a meal, your blood sugar doesn't spike, it just rises a little bit. And shortly after the meal, it actually falls back down quickly to baseline. Additionally, over time, over the course of the day, you don't want that blood sugar to be erratic and all over the place. You want it to be more or less constant and in a relatively tight range. And when you take a fasting blood sugar test, such as when you first wake up in the morning, you want that to be in the low risk healthy range. You don't want it to be too high either. On the other hand, poor metabolic fitness looks like this. So after a meal, you spike pretty hard, your blood sugar goes really high up, and rather than falling back down quickly, it stays elevated for a longer period of time. And then throughout the course of the day, you're not at a, at a nice tight range, instead you're going all over the place. There's a lot of variability. Now surely you know that you're not supposed to have sugary drinks and junk food and yada yada yada. But do you actually follow that? If you're like most of us, you probably cheat more than you should. The cool thing about using a continuous glucose monitor on yourself is that when you see your own behaviors, your own meal decisions, your own exercise habits, your own sleep habits, and you see your blood sugar in real time responding to those changes, it just hits differently. And because of that, I've actually made a lot of changes to my dietary habits and my exercise habits, which we'll get to shortly. And not only that, but it's really important to know that 
every individual is gonna have a different gut microbiome. They're gonna have a different genetic composition, different metabolic fitness. So a food that causes me to spike may not cause you to spike and vice versa, which is actually a big reason why the glycemic index isn't all that reliable. Now, if you've learned anything so far, let me know with a thumbs up and gently tap that subscribe button. So it'll tap, tap, tap a room. Just tap it in. Just tap it in. Give it a little tappy. Tap, tap, tap a room. These are the six lessons that I've learned from using levels. And a lot of these things you probably already knew beforehand. But again, when you see it in your own body, from your own actions, it just lands differently and actually causes behavior change, which is super cool. So first off, the order of the food you eat actually matters. Now at most restaurants, your salad comes before your entree, and that's a good thing. If you take two identical meals, you have the same veggies, the same protein, the same carbohydrates, and you eat the veggies first versus eating the carbs first, you're gonna have two very different glycemic responses. By eating high fiber foods first, like vegetables, you're front loading the gut lumen with that fibrous material. And that way, when you eat your carbohydrates next, their digestion is slowed down. And through that slower digestion, you have less of a spike. This is the same reason why having a fruit smoothie is not gonna spike you as bad as fruit juice, because the fruit smoothie still contains some level of fiber, whereas fruit juice is more or less sugar water. This brings us to the second point, which is the meal composition overall. Eating a bowl of white rice all by itself, which is mostly just carbohydrates, is gonna result in a higher spike compared to having that white rice with some other macronutrients. So in other words, if you have those carbohydrates with some protein and with some fat, then you're not gonna spike as badly. All right, number three is my favorite. Exercise is a cheat enabler. And we know that exercise before or during after a meal is gonna help you with your glycemic control, but I didn't realize by how much. Even a really relaxed, slow, steady walk for 20 minutes after dinner can do a lot in blunting the spike. But what was really fun to see is what I could get away with after doing an intense bike ride. So the more intense that bike ride was, the more I could get away with. And on those longer, more intense rides, I'd go home, have two scoops of ice cream and some cookies, and I wouldn't spike. It was crazy. This was actually really wild to see firsthand. So now if I am craving some sweets, which happens from time to time, then I'll actually make sure to do it after a really intense bike ride, just to minimize the damage. Number four is that eating later actually complicates things. Eating the exact same meal at either 6 p.m. or 10 p.m. is gonna have two very different effects on both your blood sugar as well as on your sleep. Now, why is that? Melatonin, which is the sleep hormone, is released by your pineal gland and it rises at night, signaling that it's time to go to bed. It also inhibits insulin secretion by binding on receptors on the pancreas. Now, I didn't realize how big of an effect this was until I spiked to like, 200 after having a late night meal when I was traveling. Now, interestingly, this hyperglycemia and then the reactive hypoglycemia wreaks havoc on your sleep. And the way I've been able to quantify this is by using a sleep tracker, I use the Aura Ring, and that looks at HRV or heart rate variability, resting heart rate, sleep zones, temperature, a few other factors too. Speaking of sleep, being sleep deprived actually really increases the variability, the up and down movements of my blood sugar for the course of the whole next day. So rather than smooth gradual changes, it was going all over the place. And that was even after just having five hours of sleep rather than my more normal seven or eight. And finally, as I mentioned in my video on the five bad habits I learned from medical school, I tend to eat really, really fast, which is not a good habit, but it's just a remnant from my plastic surgery days. When you gotta run to the OR or handle this like patient care issue, then you're, you're scarfing down food as quickly as possible so then you can just bolt out and handle business. The issue is that it spikes your blood sugar way worse compared to just eating slowly and normally and enjoying your meal like a regular human being. If you guys can't already tell, I really love what Levels is doing. They're bringing the utility and the health benefits of a continuous glucose monitor to the masses. And they even have this really slick app so you don't even have to be a doctor to interpret the results. If you wanna sign up for Levels and give it a try yourself, I got a custom link from them that's gonna allow you to skip the line. Link down in the description. Additionally, I did two separate interviews with some of the founders of Levels, Josh Clemente and Dr. Casey Means. They're amazing people. They started this amazing company. You're gonna love them. You can check them out right here. Much love, and I'll see you guys there. Oh, and that's a wrap.